you know, some of the, so much of the work I'm doing at the moment is to do with accessibility. Um, so for people who might get like motion sick for stuff or for people who might be deaf who are playing our game, it's super handy to have everything in one location. So I can just be like, you can just turn this stuff off or you can enable a setting which like plays subtitles of the sound effects which are playing, which is a nightmare if everything's doing your own thing. Uh, so sometimes it means going <laughs> back to the project and redirecting everything again because we hadn't had the manager in the past. Uh, so yeah, a lot of <laughs> a lot of like janitorial work, really. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Steve Sparks, um, not Steve Sparkles. Uh, Steve is a game developer um, and uh, also just a pretty nice guy and uh, has some interesting perspectives on things in general. Uh, Steve, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming on. So we probably should explain the sparkles thing for people just tuning in because I feel like out of context, that's probably not the best introduction. I can re-record it if you want. <laughs> no, no, that's perfectly fine. I try to own it now. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a bit of a thing for like the last few years where people misrate, uh, misread my surname Sparks as sparkles. And I'm not entirely sure why. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you did ask earlier if you should uh, send it to my... Uh, email address and contact at Steve Sparkles. And it's like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just try to own it now. Um, Cause it's, uh, well, it's very memorable for a name. So maybe that helps with uh, industry networking and all that. Yeah, no, it makes sense to me. And um, it's one of those things, like I was telling you, like when we were off camera about there's that WTF YouTube troupe and they do social experiments. And there's one where this like large black guy is asking people if they want to see his big black clock, like like the thing that tells time. But he's asking everybody this on the street. And people are like, oh, get away from me, mister. Because like, you know, obviously they think he means something else. So I don't know. I think if a word is one letter off from a word that you know, the tendency is to, you know, assume that person typed their own name wrong. So... I feel like an ass. <laughs> I've definitely it played was. into it though, because even my current job at uh, Bonsai Collective, when they did a welcome to the team post on their website, uh, they misspelled it there, and I was just like, I'm just going to leave it, you know? Like, why not? So did you not say anything to anyone? There. I did bring it up, and then they're like, well, do you want us to change it? And I was like, you know what? No, leave it. Leave it. Why not? I'm just going to have to own it. Or for the rest of my life, I'm going to be fighting it. Like, you know, every time someone brings it up, have to correct them. Oh, actually, it's just Sparks. It's a seventh century Nordic name, if you didn't know. <laughs> like, <doesn't> <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. It actually, it, so it means like Sparks, as in uh, like a bright spark, someone who's clever, but it was given to idiots as a joke, which is just great. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. My name it's means idiot, real. it's an insult. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's like the way we call people, uh, you know, like you're like, you're a cretin. You know, if it's your friend, that's not actually a cretin. For sure. Yeah. I'm a Viking idiot. That's how that name comes about. It's badass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, clearly you're not an idiot. So we, we met in uh, Brussels a few days ago, um, just kind of hanging out. And immediately it came to light. We're both engineers. And so we kind of bonded over that. And... Uh, yeah, I, uh, I was interested because you, you'd mentioned you'd made the transition from being uh, more of an artist to like an actual programmer that does linear algebra and other kinds of math that are beyond my comprehension. And so <laughs> I was, I was kind of interested to hear about that and how you made that transition and kind of what it takes to code games and, you know, I don't know, mm. dig into that a little more. Sure thing. Um, yeah, so like as you were saying, uh, I started off as a sound artist, uh, which is different from a sound designer who would make sound effects for film and different media. Uh, for me, it was games. And it's different to a composer 
sound i i don't even know if i should go into it but i went to a uni no, course no, no, no. uh for sound arts where they hammered into us that you cannot ever make anything musical like you are not allowed to use musical theory you can learn it <laughs> only to not do it which sounds super jazzy and cool but it was very very pretentious to be quite honest and the whole reason i did that course was because i wanted to do uh, like music and sound effects for games uh, but I ended up kind of teaching myself how they to told do that you stuff. Your dream was and dead, and so pretty, pretty much they were like, "Oh, it's such a sellout thing to do like music for games." It's just like, "All right, well, I'm a sellout then. Uh, see you." <laughs> <laughs> and I never actually finished that course. I didn't get an undergrad because um, I just didn't finish that course. I, the last submission, I was just like, "I don't want to do this. I got bad things to do." Um, That's actually sorry, amazing. it wasn't even so a dropout. I just failed it <laughs> when i was doing my undergrad in computer science i, I remember I, I you know they were all telling us you know get us ready for careers as programmers and no disrespect <laughs> but i really didn't want to be a programmer and so I, I just felt like you know a lot of it was like you know you're not going to be able to make creative decisions you know your job is to kind of keep your head down and for undergrad you know i, I probably shouldn't say i didn't go to the best university because people can look up what it was i don't want to Top crap, but it wasn't like a like a top tier, you know, like amazing, like you know, best in the world school. And so, I remember I just spent a lot of my time like sketching in the margins of my notebooks, like electrical schematics, and every free moment I got, you know, I, I would try to work on robotics projects, and and that's what I was really passionate about. And so it, it sounds almost kind of similar, you know, you're just like, like I don't feel like I belong uh, here. Yeah. I did a similar thing to you, I think, where towards the end of whilst I was at university and then like the, the year or so afterwards, um, I got much more into actually implementing uh, the sounds that I was making uh, within the game engine, uh, cool. which then led me to start learning how to code things and to work with like libraries based off of what the engine was using. Um, and they kind of clicked a little bit more. There's a lot of people who make really, really good music and sounds. Um, so it felt a lot better to kind of start doing work, which I could really easily see what I was contributing to the project. And then it kind nice. of just went from there, really. Um, I would end up working with friends on their projects who would just be like, oh, hey, yeah, we need someone who can program a game. Also, it's multiplayer and online. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So you had to learn networking, oh, well, like race music. conditions. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, what was so the first game you worked on, like a multiplayer? Uh, sorry, I didn't no, no, the first... No, sorry, sorry, yeah. It's just a bit of a delay, I guess. Uh, I'm doing the same to you, so don't worry, we'll wind each other up. Perfect. Um, the first game I worked on uh, was actually a... Yeah, do you know... I don't know if you know Pikmin from Nintendo. If not, I can. Uh... I honestly, I just, it's been so long since I played games. I think I told you I had like a bit of an addiction problem with them back in the day, so I cut myself off. So it's basically just like a bunch of little plant goblin things, and you gotta like manage whole groups of them, and you're kind of leading these giant crowds of these weird little plant creatures. Oh, that sounds like fun. It's so it's this big like crowd thing, and our game was like often compared to that, where it was a game set or vaguely based around the events of like the Berlin Wall, um, oh, cool. set in a city, which is basically kind of again 1984-esque, lots of inspiration from there, but completely clamped down um, police board. state, uh, and you'd be like collecting up groups of rebels, but you'd have to convince them to like join your side first, and then. It it dealt with a lot of dark themes, but it looks super cutesy, like super like lo fi, <laughs> low poly, all of these little tiny characters, uh whilst all set in this really like authoritarian, like abusive city. Um so that was a it was a cool yes. one to, to work on and um That sounds like a lot like of fun, was, actually. Yeah, for for what was essentially a student project, like that that I think we kind of got the balance right with that stuff and that we kept it as simple as we could uh, so people could just get the idea from like even just seeing it not having to play it um and that really helps when you're making games is like not to make it too complex if you're doing new stuff um yeah that that, that was the first thing i worked on that's cool 
That, that sounds and that you'd be able to get that working multiplayer. Hmm. And so that wasn't a multiplayer one. That was one where I was still Got working okay. more as a like a composer kind of uh, composer of sounds. Um, it was after that when I was looking for more work to do uh, that some people I'd met at a competition uh, which we'd taken part in with the Berlin Wall game. It's called the Wallshell Stand as well, uh, if anyone wants nice. to look for it, I guess. The Wallshell um, Stand. Uh, a website you got for it? or? Oh my God, this is this is like a student project kind of thing. So you'll find okay, it, and yeah. there's a there's a I believe there's a playable uh, build of it online. You can download. Nice. Um, but it's just that doesn't always exist now, for but... student projects. Yeah. <laughs> Usually um, you're lucky if there's even a GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, it is cool that you can actually like grab a hold of that thing. Um, it, it was the the game I worked on after that, which ended up being like a, uh, a multiplayer online game. And it was also like split screen, so you could have four controllers with like oh, cool. people actually stand next to you, which you know used to it be is more like of reminiscent a, thing a couple of, of years Nintendo. ago. What was that? Sorry. Well, growing up, I played Nintendo sixty four with my siblings, so we do like a lot of Mario Kart, and I feel like that was that was how it worked. It's super important, honestly. Like actually being able to play with someone else like in the same room is completely different to just being online um there were a lot of cool photos taken of people playing that game when we take it to events if ever there was a photographer around afterwards we'd just be like combing through all of their gallery and just choosing all the ones of like oh look these people are actually having a good time and we think nice. they're playing our game but we can't quite tell from that angle but <laughs> we'll say they're playing our game no one will know on the internet yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> we did um, this event uh, during Q4 of 2020 where we had these five kilogram robots that you could drive on a, uh, I mean, I've said this before on the podcast, so I'll keep it short, but it basically it was a, uh, an industrial disaster that was mocked up. We, we had a administrative assistant at the time who was a Broadway set designer out of work and she designed the whole thing and then a bunch of us put it together and built it. And then we were just letting people drive our robots through it. And um, the smiles you'd see on people's faces, like on, on the, the Zoom or the Google Hangout or the Microsoft Teams call was, was incredible because uh, you just felt good. Like you're like, I, I made that person's day better. <laughs> so, yeah. That is real nice. It's because it's, you get your own kind of satisfaction from doing work and like overcoming a challenge from something you've made. But quite often that's not, what other people are going to see if ever there's an end user for the thing you're making they don't really care like how it was made behind the scenes they just give a want it to do the thing which is fun or useful or whatever kind of thing you're making for the user slash client yep exactly i i completely agree so yeah so when you see that reaction and, and you see someone's really jazzed about it i mean you know you don't get that with you know something that no one ever gets to gets to look at so it's good when you get, to, when you get the, to actually show your work uh yeah that can be one of the like interesting things with the work i'm doing now um at bonsai collective is that you can make some of the most simple stuff which is like really flashy like oh i've made a new gun or i've made a new enemy and people are like that's amazing you've done really great work and it might have only taken me like, you know, a couple of hours to do. And there's always the really big like back end systems which are managing like multiple different types of assets <laughs> and making sure that the game is always in sync with these particular things. It's something super simple Nobody like I, this that. camera shake. Yeah, I, I've made it so that you can turn down the camera shake uh, if it makes you feel motion sick. And people are like, oh, okay. oh cool. <laughs> That's good that that setting, if, they did, if it wasn't there, they would notice. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did it yeah, take to do that like, to implement that feature so a lot of when you're making a game for like uh say for a normal development length like two years and you're not just students you're like doing this legit you're going to sell this and make some money um you kind of need to make things in such a way that you can easily go in and change them preferably preferably from like a single location um, so there's a lot of uses of like managers, um, we call them. So rather than having a bunch of different things, say you've got like a gun and an enemy and like a, I don't know, like an elevator in the game, you don't want them all to be doing like their own screen shake or all playing their own sound effects. You want to like redirect everything to managers 
so that you can just go in and just change stuff or you know some of the so much of the work i'm doing at the moment is to do with accessibility um so for people who might get like motion sick with stuff or for people who might be deaf who are playing our game it's super handy to have everything in one location so i can just be like you can just turn this stuff off or you can enable a setting which like plays subtitles of the sound effects which are playing which is a nightmare if everything's doing our own thing uh so sometimes it means going back through the project and redirecting everything again because we hadn't had the manager in the past. Uh, so yeah, a lot of a lot of like janitorial work really at the moment with the whole manager stuff. Yeah, it sounds it's similar to kind of like maybe I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but like I have friends that are in DevOps and they talk about like having to make things more scalable or practical or just clean up, you know. Like they'll they'll have somebody on their team who's got a PhD who's super brilliant in certain ways, but maybe they don't know how to make something um, practical for the real world. So you'll have like single letter variable names. Um, you'll have like repository files and like three different repos, um, and it won't build from any one of them. You'll need to somehow figure out how to consolidate them, and the documentation sucks. So you have you're kind of on your own to figure that out, and all this the documentation stuff. always um, sucks. Yeah, I'm actually sort of um, uh, censoring a story somebody told me last week. You know? So um, while I was on vacation, uh, <laughs> it's interesting. I, I mean, I guess you never really, you know, if you are really interested in what you do, you're never really not not present for it. So mm -hmm. it, it was amusing, right? He's He's like, uh, and then his boss was breathing down his neck to work on this thing. Um, and he's like, look, if you should take a shit on my desk, don't be mad if it still smells the next day. <laughs> you know? It's the metaphor he used. <laughs> so it, it almost sounds kind of similar, like, like just to, to make all that stuff work in concert is like non-glamorous, but it's glamorous if you understand it. But most people are never going to see that level of detail on it. It's one of those things where uh, people usually the people you're working with, because you kind of got two end users uh, as a games programmer. Uh, you've got the people who are actually buying and playing the game, but then you've also got the people in your team who are using the tools you make. Uh, so people will notice if stuff is breaking, <laughs> but if you do everything perfectly, then nobody even notices it, notices like it at all. It's just like, oh, it just works. And it's like, yeah, it just works because I did that for like two weeks. But thank you. <laughs> yeah, I worked my ass off to make it that stable. <laughs> mm. That's cool. It's, it's so, funny that you mentioned the single character variable thing, just because that's probably the one thing me and my lead programmer talk about the most <laughs> anytime. We, we don't really do like code reviews so much because uh, we kind of trust each other to do this stuff. And we, we all kind of have areas of um, like responsibility for certain things. So if something breaks, it's not like, oh, it's because I added something to this class. It's like, that's my class, so I need to go look at it to like fix it up. But the one thing I nice. do talk about all the time is just like, should this like variable be like set checkpoint with checkpoint or just set checkpoint? Because the other one takes like numbers, this one takes a reference to the checkpoint, and then it's just it's so pedantic, and we all know that. And that's how we start the conversation with sure. like, this is a bit pedantic, but you know, it's going to be a half hour long discussion of like word play, basically. Uh, but I, I feel like if you don't have that break discussion. During the day. Oh, okay. I, I know we've had those discussions in, in software projects and I, I'll, you know, full disclosure, I'm mainly a hardware guy, but I, I've managed software projects recently and at least with defining interfaces seems to be the most important thing, but then also just defining standards within a team. Like it's the sort of thing where if you don't spend, you know, the two hours to have that meeting or the half an hour or whatever it takes, you know, then you're sort of, you know, you're fucked down the line because, you know, that's when it starts to, the disconnect come up. And I've done it that way where I've like, at least earlier in my career where I assume people would just figure it out and they, they don't because, you know, of course, you've never communicated a standard and there's no right answer all the time. It's just it's got to be unified. So am I making sense or is that kind of sort of... Yeah, no, recently in the last couple of weeks, actually, we just started writing up dictionaries for stuff we've been talking about because uh, there's something particular in the game I made before, uh, which I specifically called it like a, like a weapon mod. 
because it modifies stuff with the weapons. And then I hear that other people just call them mods. And they're like, all right, so we can just chuck a mod on this player character, or we can chuck a mod on this other random thing, which isn't a weapon. I'd be like, I'm calling it a weapon mod for a reason. <laughs> so we went yeah. through literally everything in the game and just wrote up this massive dictionary of things because sometimes you end up calling stuff different things or we're not quite sure exactly what the difference between like different stuff is. And it's it's super dry stuff. But it's super Did you super start dry. with like variables or like how did you how do you go about writing that dictionary? <laughs> mostly it's kind of like design led i guess uh because sometimes we'll be talking about things which don't exist in any form at all in the project it might be the kind of thing of like all right when an enemy is going to shoot that gun they probably shouldn't just shoot it straight away they should have some kind of like animation going on which makes it look like they're picking up the weapon or they're about to like reload it before they shoot or something oh, cool. so then it's like okay so what do we call period of time do we call it like a telegraph do we call it like a warm-up and if people are using different words that's when we start to get confused about what does and doesn't exist so yeah yeah then you write a dictionary and then you forget to check the dictionary and then of course <laughs> i was gonna ask where you keep it because that's that always happens on our teams is like if we don't we used to keep like maybe like google slides decks of like in some cases they get up to like over a hundred slides of like different systems engineering diagrams and glossaries like where do you where do you keep your dictionary so it's it's easier to access and we've been using confluence with i think cool. it's atlassian if you make it but yeah, it's just nice product, i believe yeah yeah it's it's pretty snazzy um they keep reinventing the wheel with their own stuff it feels like they'll like update it every few years and then it's like oh yeah we haven't got the old features into this new version yet like okay thanks um but it's it's nice being able to just like link a bunch of different stuff the jira no <laughs> yeah we're using jira as well similar thing it's it cracks me up with jira because yeah. like they keep changing stuff but they don't roll out the changes to all users at once so we'll all be sharing our screens of our own task tracking stuff and it's like why do you have like arrows on your thing where if i've got like lines what do these mean? <laughs> like my symbols keep changing like what <laughs> so you never know Jesus. like what's high priority and what isn't because they just keep changing what the bloody icons are fuck me i feel like salesforce is kind of like that too like they it's it's so complicated that it's difficult to to maintain a grasp on the software which is a little bit frustrating but it's powerful so you're like, I want this to work. <laughs> I want to understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Atlassian I'm a fan of, but I don't know. Like you said, it's it's weird that they they keep playing with it and you're like, I just want it to, <laughs> to do the thing. I want it to do the same the, thing that it did last time I opened it. You know? <laughs> I feel that way about the G Suite too. Like the, the Google products are like that, where I feel like they'll just add features whenever the fuck they feel like it. And there's not a whole lot of continuity of, of, you know, like a usage pattern or maybe usage pattern is the wrong word. Um, the design changes at random and you have to figure out, you know, like how to use it. But Atlassian products, I feel like are way more complicated than Google products. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's always like when you end up finding oh, the, the Jira stuff actually recently, I was like trying to find a... So you got a task in Jira, task tracking software, and you'll sign one person to be in, in charge of that task. Okay, great. What if I want to sign two people to be in charge of it? So I had a little Google, found their forum and a post, and it was just straight up someone who was either like an authorized staff member of the forum or someone who actually straight up works for Atlassian. And they were just arguing <laughs> with everyone. Everyone was just like, look, I just want to assign two people for this. And they're like, no, no, no that's, not, that's not how it works when you do your job there's only one person who's responsible for something and if you're trying to get two people to be responsible you're doing it wrong and people are just like look just say you won't add it as a what feature like, don't be a dick about it like what? it was mad yeah that's, that's yeah that's not the kind of engineer that should be talking to the public <laughs> like that's it's like community service kind of thing. Like, all right, for a hundred hours every year, you've got to like go on the forums for a bit. And it was just a bad day for me. <laughs> like, all right, let's take this out. Like, all right, people. I'll do it, but I'm going to be an asshole to everybody. <laughs> yeah. 
and then you never have to do it again. So, you know, maybe it worked out for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That might have been it, to be honest. It's like, I'm just going to troll everybody. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's no way to treat your user base, I don't think. Um, we run into stuff like that, too, with like, you know, PM suites. Like, I feel like it's never perfect. Um, I use Trello a lot. And so um, Kanban's great, but it's kind of difficult for um, if you have a deadline. <laughs> There's no way to attach that to anything. So you almost need like an external document that's like, you know, this is when we need to get it done by. <laughs> oh, that's when you start layering in other things to like keep track of where you are on the project. And it's just like, I thought the whole point of using this software is so that we know what we're doing. Not like, oh yeah, it says the deadline's here, but there's actually the other document which is tracking the actual submission deadline. So like, I stop just. And that's why I like Trello, because it's just like, it feels like post-it notes. Like, you can just keep it super simple. Yeah, um, yeah, same. I love simplicity. I mean, they, I, I like Trello too. I mean, I, I'm referring to that system as Kanban, but I've talked about Kanban in other episodes of the podcast with like moving post-its around. Um, so in, in the context of, and forgive me if this is too pedantic, but in the context of like, machine shop inventory tracking. So like you've got a physical shop, you've got so many nuts and so many bolts of different types. Maybe you've got some gears, you know, you've got like a box of resistors and you never want to run below a certain amount of each part, part of inventory. Kanban is like a physical index card that you'll stick behind like the second to last box of whatever fastener that you're trying to reorder. And when you encounter that index card, you put it in a bin that says to order. And then, you know, like every week, you know, your purchasing manager goes through and grabs all the shit out of that bin. And in our case, they scan it with a barcode reader and it places the order. Uh, but you could just even like write down a URL or like, you know, a part number and then type it in and, you know, it would be pretty much the same thing. And so I like that because of the simplicity. I mean, it's physical. It's all there. Trello also calls their system Kanban. So it's um, because you're moving these things around. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, lucky. I didn't know it came from that. That's interesting. It's interesting as well that the stuff yeah. that you would use that stuff for is like actual physical things. That's the resource. Whereas I guess with the work I do, it's just time. Time is the resource, but yeah. uh, you can't order more time. But it's this. interesting <laughs> because you don't actually have a link to time in Trello. Like there's no, there's no way to quantify what a task will take as far as I, not Trello, sorry. Um, yeah, Trello. I, I, Get my wires crossed. I've used software which does do that. And then you end up spending like 80% of your time being like, oh, here's the estimated amount of time. Oh, I've banked to this amount of time on this task. It just ends up becoming like, it's just like the graphs look really cool, but also you only did 10% of the work <laughs> you could have done. When really just want to say, all right, this is in progress. Okay, it's done now or it's ready for review, that kind of thing. Just, yeah. yeah, no, it's an interesting thing because good. managers want to know, like, like as managers, I feel like we're very risk adverse and, you know, there's something one of my mentors always says to me, which is you can't write a blank check, you know, so like I can't pay an indefinite amount of money to get this project done unless I know how long it's going to take. So I need to estimate first, but as an engineer, <laughs> I've also been in the situation you're describing where, you know, it's, it's like, um, I've spent 160 hours, you know, for a project that hasn't kicked off yet, trying to estimate the resources it would take to do that project, you know, because it's research and development and it's never been done before. And so, I don't know, I don't know what the right answer is or if there necessarily is a universal one. I feel like I know what the right answer is supposed to be and it's agile, but it's, it's difficult maybe like 100% of the time to say that. like. I spoke with a big petrochemical company recently that you've heard of, but I can't say the name of. And <laughs> they had fired a certain percentage of their staff, um, like a big percentage where people were, were nervous. And they had pledged to convert the company to um, all agile by like a certain date. But I don't think they knew what it meant. So they, they had contacted my firm to 
come in and help them with it. But then they were asking us for like requirements documents and stuff that isn't agile. And so it was all very confusing um, and, uh, you know, ended up kind of not moving forward at that point. But I, um, I don't think you want yeah. what you say, what you want. <laughs> so I can't help you. That was it. And I, I think I said that, right? I'm just like, you know, you, you're asking us about agile, but, but the terminology you're using isn't congruent with that methodology. So I'm not sure what you actually want here. <laughs> I think what they wanted was not to get fired. Um, if I'm <laughs> speaking on behalf of the engineers I was talking to. <laughs> By the way, this Uzo is delicious. Uh, what are you drinking right now? I'm drinking the same beers that I was drinking when I met you the other week, actually. Uh, maize? Oh, nice. Mice? Mice is actually a Welsh word, but I'm assuming this isn't Welsh, seeing as it's a Belgian beer. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> certainly, a, certainly a beer. Um, the thing which is like actually like <laughs> certainly a uh, beer. <laughs> <laughs> the thing which is like I found really cool here was that well in the UK um, you've got crates of beers and it's just when you buy like uh, in bulk you know sixteen to twenty four or whatever cans in like a box, but a cardboard box. But here they actually just sell them in crates and I was like that's probably where the name came from. It all makes sense now. It was just really weird it's terminology it's like just that to call it like a crate too. Mm. So you take well, the whole they, thing and like crates? Think, no, no, here they're plastic and you can take them back. So that's what it was like in the Czech Republic. Mm. So you pay like a deposit, don't you? And then you get the deposit back. Yeah, it was like five euros, but it was a crate. pretty solid crate. Yeah. Yeah, I'm using them for so decoration, I... for like doing recycling stuff in it. They're super handy. You could totally, you could totally use that as like a table, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff you could do with it. They're solid. I'm drinking this, uh, this Uzo. It's, uh, I'm in Greece as, as I told you, so I figured, <coughs> um, do the Greek thing and drink Uzo for the podcast. So, it's decent. Kind of a fun departure from whiskey. Yeah, it's good stuff. And then if you mix it with water, it gets to be all like milky. And so I have no idea yeah, how that reaction with that? works, but. I don't know, but it's clear. The water's clear. And you mix them together and it turns white. So it's kind of fun. It's going to be one of those things where, like, you know, many use the tap water for drinking or something. <laughs> like, uh, well. No, no, no. So this is bottled water I'm using, right? So it's just like years ago, I, I grabbed Uzo one time and I read something on the internet that was like, mix it with water and it'll turn white and it tastes good. <coughs> so I started doing that. And uh, it's kind of fun. I don't know enough about chemistry to know why that works, but that's pretty cool. Some like Jesus either. of Nazareth yeah. kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I try not to look anything up on the on the show because I feel like it'd be one thing if we had like an in studio producer, someone else that could do it, but we don't because we don't have budget for that. So, and I'm not even in a studio. I'm in a I'm in a hotel room in Crete. So. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we'll just speculate. And if we get it wrong, you know, send all hate mail to podcast at ska.solutions. You can see that the place that I've moved into in the last few weeks has got like hotel vibes going on. It's all just beige, white. I think the most exciting bit of oh, color yeah. in the place is the floors are a bit brown. Like, wow, cool. <laughs> Do the floors here, I, I, I don't want to move the laptop because I'll, I'll like knock my microphone over and everything, but it's kind of cool. Like they're, it's like mosaic tiles. It's, it's, um, it like, I don't know. It feels like fucking Greek as hell. <laughs> like it's, it's like very, very stonework. Then the ceilings are like, maybe like, I don't know if I had to put it in meters, like maybe like five meters high. So, I don't know, it's kind of, kind of oh, that's pretty intense. Quite, quite an upgrade from the Airbnb I was staying at on the other side of the island. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's I one thing that really the surprised so me. Nice. Oh, sorry, no, go on. No, no, after you. I was going to say real quick that uh, when I was looking around for different flats, different apartments to rent in Belgium, one thing which was the biggest culture shock is that they have so many chairs in every room. Like, it sounds ridiculous, but... 
legit they've got about like 12 chairs in every room and it's like how many guests are you Fuck expecting me. like what why maybe they're just really proud of their carpentry i don't know but so many of them <laughs> just go and look at like any apartment I mean, the carpentry is belgium. nice in belgium mm-hmm. <laughs> so keep making yeah, i will say when i stay so good i kind of love it though like when i stay like anywhere in belgium that's like a uh i want to say a um like isn't a hotel like i feel like it's just so uh it's like medieval like it's it's kind of just fucking neat like you can tell it's been there for a while and uh it's into, like the last time i was in brussels uh would have been like three years ago and i went on airbnb and i found um a room in the basement of a piano factory and it wasn't really a factory it was like a piano repair workshop <coughs> but i mean i slept in this like totally walled off like brick room and it was like it was like wine cellar cool it was sweet and then um they were just a bunch of pianos everywhere and so naturally there was like musicians attracted to the space and they had interesting things to say and uh ended up finding this really awesome jazz show that night it was, it was fun that sounds wacky it's really cool dude brussels is fucking cool like i'm, I'm kind of jealous that you get to live there now so it's been growing on me in that I didn't expect there to be this amount of like weird stuff because <clears throat> the fact that like when we met up like last week we ended up going to a scar gig uh, at a crossbow museum like it, yeah exactly you am for that kind of stuff you know and it's just like all right yeah let's go to it <laughs> dude I thought it was a fucking typo when they said ska it was like jazz slash ska I was like, they can't possibly mean the ska that I'm familiar with. <laughs> and it was a full-on ska concert. I don't know if we can get the band's info in here. It was purpleized. I mean, I don't know if people would even care about it that watch this podcast. But <laughs> so if you like, you know, white people music from the '90s, you should you should check this out. It's very good. <laughs> Such a weird event as well, just because a lot of people like working there were all of these guys in like their oh. 80s it seemed like who were like yeah here is my entire like career of crossbow like competitive crossbow shooting and just everyone's just decked out with all these you badges it like? And, like it, it felt like like a weirder version of like a gun club in america like there, <laughs> there are these groups where like old old american guys go to like shoot guns together and like smoke a cigar maybe and it felt like the Belgian equivalent of that is, is how it felt to me. <laughs> Crossbows. Like, I mean, like you one guy was cool. like, he's like, you know, velt meter, you know, he's like 20 meters, you know, shoot like these crossbows. <laughs> he was like so proud of like the fact that he could hold a crossbow grouping at 20 meters, you know, it was like, it, which is very similar to how like guys that are into guns in America act about like their their target accuracy. <laughs> so and just in the meantime we're all just drinking and dancing to scar as well while they're trying to like, talk about this stuff. On on a range. So surreal. On a range. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were so the dance floor uh for those that are listening that know anything about weaponry was was down range on a firing range. It was disused. Nobody was firing crossbows while we were dancing, but it still didn't feel safe. <laughs> it was fun. I, I still, I still danced. I had fun. And, uh, that, that was enjoyable. That was a really good night. I had a great time. And got to be back in bed by two a.m. as well. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if I was so lucky. Um, I met I met this woman from Ireland that was really interesting. She kept, uh, I think she'd had quite a few drinks. She kept breaking into Irish, um, which obviously I don't speak. <laughs> so, but she was so friendly. She was like, you know, like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just had a few drinks, you know. I guess there's like a big movement to bring back that language. And she explained some of the history to me, which was like, you know, kids being put in irons for speaking their own language by the British and shit. So I'm like, oh, that's fucked up, you know. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, I'm, I'm Welsh and like the same thing happens with Welsh as well. And they're a little bit more successful uh, with stamping that stuff out. Shitty. Yeah. <coughs> but I thought the kingdom was united. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. 
absolutely. That's you know, it's like with anything else. If you have to say you're cool or you're funny, you're not that. It's <laughs> for other people to call you the United Kingdom. You can't call yourself United. It doesn't work like that. United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I'm I was with looking you on recently. That. Uh, that... I saw recently that there was a, a bill which was rejected uh, before it got through the Senate. But at one point in the 20th century, uh, there was a vote on whether the USA should be renamed to United States of Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, actually. Yeah, it never got. I can't remember which way. Oh, it's like you got idea. the Senate and the and Congress. I can't remember which one's which. Uh, but it, it just like, that stuff too. Dude. If I'm being honest, mm, basically just like dead but on arrival. Like, who the fuck? <laughs> why would they want to do that? Like that just seems so silly. Like that's you talk about Orwellian. I mean, I guess you know the British Empire is like a pretty key example of that too. You know, just taking over other places, you know, their whole existence until World War Two, and then they kind of. You know, lost a lot of property. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. so. so this is interesting stuff to me because I don't know a whole lot about it. I don't have the same proximity you do. So we we can oh, change sure. the topic. I'm just I'm just interested. No, no, you can talk about it, absolutely. Yeah. If you've got any questions about yeah you know, the so when was United when was Wales Kingdom. absorbed into the British Empire? I guess like. Uh, like we were probably the first to, well, it's one of those things where like, I think on some legal technicality, I don't think Wales is actually its own country. I think it's technically a principality, okay. which is like, That's weird. okay, like to, to like tell other people like, oh, hey, I'm from the country of Wales. And to have them say, well, it's not actually a country. It's like, okay, like, <laughs> thanks. Um, but that that was like you're going back to like the 1100s, um, and after that, wow. like it's yeah, because it, Wales wasn't really like its own fully united country. Uh, it was like a lot of different like petty kings who owned the different areas of Wales, which probably made it easier to conquer. Um, so. Well, there was this guy uh, who basically almost uh, like united everything, and then the English just like assassinated him essentially uh whichever stopped that from happening and then yeah like you're saying you could just then just take all the other little smaller beds because wells is it's pretty small um we've got more sheep than people so <laughs> um Jesus. yeah it's been so long that we've been part of england that it's never wells is never referred to as its own country and the only time i've ever seen wells actually do stuff by itself, like make its own decisions has actually been through the coronavirus pandemic where we all make different rules on whether people should wear masks, what are the different restrictions and all that. And that's been the bigger shit show in the UK, like <laughs> since Brexit, yeah. um, is that just every country well, has like just like done stuff differently. No, uh, no. What, what else have you worked on now that we've gone all over um, yeah, so uh, I think one thing, because you mentioned, yeah, do, do you want me to talk about math stuff or math stuff? Yeah, yeah, actually, because this is one of the things you and I talked about when we first met was, you know, robotics um, versus game design. And, you know, you seem to think robotics was somehow like, like this lofty thing. And I'm like, actually, the game developers are some of the best roboticists that exist. Because you guys understand, you know, linear algebra and spatial, you know, mathematics and just basically ways to parse the physical world, um, you know, that are critical to making robots work. Now, I would say rookie, you know, th there's some discrepancies. So you mentioned like being able to manipulate gravity is something you could do to, to make a game run smoother. You can't do that in real life. <laughs> but... Yeah, I'd be interested to kind of get into that more. Like, what's some of the math you need to do your job? So I was having a bit of a think of this after you mentioned it uh, last week in person. And it's interesting that we're almost like approaching stuff from different directions. And that in robotics or any kind of engineering, you're given the set of rules that you've got to abide by. And that can be like, oh, gravity is real. 
uh, electricity is a thing. <laughs> uh, this box I got on the floor weighs five kilos. You can't change that. Whereas in games, you start off with none of that. So in, the in theory, you can just like teleport stuff around, which would be great as a roboticist if you could do that. Uh, but yeah, instead with games, you're Who introducing that inconveniences. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but you, you're introducing like inconveniences through maths with games. So we're trying to introduce all of that annoying stuff that you have to overcome as an engineer, uh, which is interesting. Maybe we can meet somewhere in the which middle. Which makes the game more idea. realistic. Because you're trying to find that fun bit, aren't you? Like that's, you make stuff feel more realistic, alive and fun by introducing all of those inconveniences with maths like you know someone running around you're shooting at a guy in a game or whatever um and when they run and they stop maybe they do stumble maybe they slide a little bit before they come back or they're not 100 percent accurate because that's not fun like you don't want it to yeah, be that, that does accurate. sound way more interesting for the game that also sounds really confusing to try to fabricate. Like I would imagine it takes a lot of work to make irregularity, you know, part of um, a, a fake reality. Because there's got to be rules to it as well. Like uh, we've got some enemies in the game, which we're working on at the moment with bonsai, which are like essentially turrets. Um, and if they shoot where you're at, uh, you can just, just run sideways and they'll never hit you. So it's like, okay, maybe they need to be a little bit predictive where if you're moving in a direction, they'll try and shoot towards there. But you also can't have it be 100% accurate because then it just seems super unfair. So you're just like fudging, yeah. a lot of like random numbers at times and just like fudging things, making stuff a little bit mushy and not as efficient as it could be. Um, so yeah, it's because it's super easy to make something in games which is like omnipotent or can just be like omnipresent everywhere at sure. once. And you've got to, you've got to make these rules to limit the abilities of a thing. And then you've got to be able to communicate that to the end user, the player, so that it feels like you're playing on the same, on the same level. Now, how do you communicate that? Like, do they just learn by dying in the game or do they, do they learn it by, you know, like you have a tutorial that walks them through, like what's, what's sort of your favorite way to, to communicate those imperfections there's a few different ways of doing it um because a, a lot games have been a medium now for long enough that there's kind of a shared language between them which like develops over time so sometimes in some games you can actually get away with just reusing like a mechanic uh, like a system from a previous game which is a really popular genre of games you can do the same thing and you don't always need to communicate it um but then yeah perhaps like someone who hasn't played a lot of games recently um it's i found that it's better to get people to learn through trial and error um rather than just stopping the whole thing and being like hey read this document here's what's going on because you don't really quite that makes sense take it me. in that way uh, well, I think you could have like a voiceover, like, "Hey, these guys are pretty bad at you know aiming because of this," or you know, like some excuse, you know, that, that fits the storyline. But mm -hmm. I think you're right. Like, I think I think if you just if you learn through trial and error, I mean, that's probably less work to build and also more effective and fun for the user. The game I was playing last night, which. Um... Basically, because their the, the game just got released, House of Ashes, it's like an interactive cinema um, cinema experience. Interesting. And it's got a horror theme. So it's exactly like one of those yes. things where you're watching a horror film and you're shouting at the screen like, don't go there, don't go there. It's that with this, because there's a bunch of us watching two of us play. You can actually shout at the, at the, at the characters not to do that thing. Um, so and cool. I, I was a bit of a dumbass with that. Because the, the game gives you a lot of opportunities to like mess up at the beginning. Uh, but if you just keep doing the thing wrong, then eventually like characters will die. Like you will go down routes of the story you didn't want to. Uh, and <laughs> there was this whole story going on where there was like this affair between the two characters who me and my friend are playing as. Uh, and <laughs> in all the meantime, we're trying to like fight off these vampire monsters. Uh, 
And I think I got a couple of characters killed uh, just by <laughs> missing like button prompts. And I'm sure because I didn't wear my wedding ring, my husband was annoyed with me, so he didn't save me. <laughs> like, it's, 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 <laughs> Wait, you can, you can do that? You can choose to, like, remove your wedding ring in the context of the game? Right at the beginning. Like, it starts off with, like, yeah, my... Because stuff is happening, like, uh, at the same time. So sometimes you're playing as characters in the same scene. Sometimes it's, like, simultaneous. So uh, we didn't know what each other were doing, but you could kind of hear from the audience who were watching us, like, what, what, what was happening. And I was just like... Oh, wait, were you guys, like, in separate rooms? Like, how does that fucking work? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we, we, we streamed it through uh, Discord. Um, so everything, we were oh, both cool. just playing it online. And we could both stream it. Uh, and people could, I think you could switch between it or you could stream both. But then you got to mute the audio for one because otherwise you're hearing the audio from the other one. Uh, so it's funny to work it's our stuff out. and then too much and then it's not as fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, we kept giving spoilers to each other about stuff. Like, we both see this one character die, and then later on, like, one of us would just be like, oh, my God, Rachel's still alive? And then, like, oh, fucking spoilers. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. and while, like, somewhere else just, like, dealing with the affair stuff, like, completely unrelated. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it was a fun, fun experience. Oh, yeah, I did enjoy that a lot. And it's no, like five sounds hours. Enjoyable. Which is... It sounds like quite a storyline. Five oh, hours sure. is not that yeah. much. I mean, like, I mean, when I used to, like, I, I told you I just had issues with playing games too much sometimes, but I would play like an Age of Empires game that would go like two days. And so, and you, of course, you can never beat that game. So you just keep playing and playing and playing. Like, actually, I, I, I will be honest, I did play um, the South Park game recently. I think it was The Stick of Truth. Mm -hmm. um, which is an old game, but like, you know, I don't play games that often. So I'll play like one that looks interesting from, you know, the last 20 years. If I find out about it every now and then. And so that one was fun because I like South Park and it was like, you know, a 10 hour South Park episode. So I just I had a lot of fun. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is a cool story. I know it's got a finite end, so I'm not going to just get addicted and not do my job. <laughs> you know, like, you know, let's play this. <laughs> Uh, something which I always look for now when I go to play something in my spare time because it's kind of true that when you work on games like as a job like you don't want to just be playing games outside of that especially because I work 10 hour days um, for four days a week um, if yeah. I was to then spend even just like, a few hours like in the evenings then that's basically all day I've spent sat on my desk in front of a screen um, so I do, yeah. I do appreciate games where, you know, uh, it's 12 hours, it's 20 hours. You could in theory smash it out on the weekends and still have time to actually go outside and remember that there's a real world. <laughs> yeah. Hug your girlfriend. <laughs> like, do, do whatever. Oh, wait, I forgot about that. Yeah. I'll make a note of that one. It's <laughs> <laughs> fucking hilarious. But it's, it's like, um. I don't know. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I like that. Like, I mean, I, I think games like that to me seem like, like almost like just a long movie, you know, it's like where, where it's more immersive like that, that strikes me as quite enjoyable. That uh, it's, they're good. It's called the dark pictures anthology, I think. And this is like the third game, which has been released in the series. Um, and they very much like lean into the whole, like, Oh, this is, pretty much like an interactive movie kind of thing. Um, and they do a lot of like motion capture work with it. So I think one of the characters in this one was played by an actor from like High School Musical. Um, oh, cool. Which is, <laughs> and they, they usually, for all of them, there's at least a couple of actors which you recognize and then they just like digitize their face and stuff. Um, Did you see- And it uh... cracked me up just, I'm sorry. I was going to say, did you see Bandersnatch on Netflix? Yes, that was, yeah. So it's kind of like the same thing with that. Cause that's actually using video, but same thing of that. Like you've got the different paths and you're making usually like one or two choices at a time. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, that was good. Yeah, I really did too. I, I actually played it through a few times and did like different decision paths just to see what would happen. So it's pretty enjoyable. I remember 
with that one. I just remember like showing it to one. Like... Yeah, well, because there was a problem with, not necessarily a problem, but I remember now comparing Bandersnatch to like these, um, uh, I've already forgotten the name of it, the Dark Pictures games. Um, you could get stuck in a bit of a loop with Bandersnatch. And I just remember one of my <laughs> friends who I showed it to just getting super frustrated from another room and just shouting, I keep killing my dad. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's because you've got to choose this thing here. Like, you're playing it wrong, you know? Uh, yeah, of course. Whereas the the cinematic, the, the Dark Pictures anthology, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a quick Google just to make sure I'm not butchering this. It's all good. If I do it, I'll screw up the whole video because of the way we're recording this. So I'll let you. I'll let you look. We could also have like our production people look it up and, and stick it at the you know the description. <laughs> A big asterisk over it when I'm saying it wrong. It is the Dark Pictures anthology, yeah. so we're good. Um, cool. But because it, it's much more of like uh, they lean into the whole. It's a film experience. Um, it means that it keeps going. Like you don't get to redo things. Like you never make a mistake and then have to go back you just get to the end of the game and all of the characters are dead so here you go here's your ending everyone died at the end <laughs> um, that's pretty cool that's pretty funny and like people are playing as different characters so once their character dies they're just out and they they become a viewer you swap characters between scenes and then it tells you at the beginning like of the scene who the other player is playing as uh so it's always just like, all right, we've got some unresolved stuff about this affair. <laughs> it's like set in Iraq. It's set in Iraq and there's all of these like vampire monsters about. And then we're so involved with like the story about the affair. <laughs> like... Who gives a fuck about the affair? Get rid of the vampire. You know? it's like... <laughs> oh. so, no, no, it's, it's an open relationship now. I don't care anymore. <laughs> just get the vampire. <laughs> That seems like the real threat here. <laughs> well, that sounds like fun, though. Honestly, like I, I think I would enjoy that. Yeah, it's good. It's good getting two people together to like try that out. It's also got like a single player mode to it, but I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know that the multiplayer was in all of them. So I've watched other people play. They release like one a year, um, and each time we'll like play through it on a stream and watch it together, like a yearly film experience. It was only this year that I found out oh. that they're all multiplayer, and it's like, what? This is great! It's so much funnier when like not only are you shouting at the TV screen to get the characters to do things, but you're shouting opposing things. Like, <laughs> so it's just yeah, hey, oh, this is great. <laughs> That's amazing. One of my friends. Um... I want to get him on the podcast. I probably will when I get back to um, my hometown of Pittsburgh uh, in the States. But I, um, he, uh, his company did a promo with Twitch where their offices like got turned into like a Twitch themed, basically uh, like an obstacle course for Boston Dynamics spot robots. And they had like oh, a bunch of gamers come those. in and drive the robots around the, the office and like compete with each other. Uh, and it was using their teleoperation software that they did it, which is the same software our, my company used to, uh, to run that demo I was telling you about. And it was cool. It was, I, I watched it. I gotta admit like some of the cultural stuff from gaming went over my head just cause I haven't been in it recently. So like they had uh, T-Pain as like one of the judges, which was kind of silly. And like, I was like, what the fuck is T-Pain doing here? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. To be honest um, with you, that sounds like there was like the one person who was available and accepted the, <laughs> the gig. At that's the it, like a B celeb <laughs> that you could get, you know? <laughs> I don't know, is T-Pain A-list? Like maybe used to be? <laughs> I don't fucking, fucking know. The name has got staying power, but it is one of those things of whenever you hear about T-Pain, you're like, are they still doing stuff? Or they just riding <laughs> out all of the money they made before. <laughs> I think that's it. I, I think it's. I think it's just trying to. Well, it's probably that, and also just trying to like stay solvent. Because <laughs> like, I mean, you hear about like Mike Tyson spending all of his fucking coin on like you know tigers and 
mansions and shit and then going bankrupt. <laughs> so, I'm sure that exists for, for people of, of all statures, right? I mean, you know, if, if Iron Mike Tyson can run out of money because, you know, you just spend like an insane person, I'm sure, you know, T-Pain, me, you, like anybody that, you know, is, is famous for a moment could do that too. By the way, big Mike Tyson fan. I probably should have prefaced that. That's like one of my favorite humans alive. <laughs> Do you try and bring up Mike Tyson at least once every podcast episode? This is the first time I brought up Mike Tyson in a podcast episode. But I did watch a Mike Tyson fight. Uh, so they had that one where they brought him back out of retirement recently um, against, uh, who was it? Um, I think Roy Jones, I think could be wrong um but I, I paid 50 dollars for like a virtual event which seemed like a silly amount of money and um me and my coworker oliver uh watched it while we were working on that obstacle course there's a like a 50 inch tv uh in that office uh that's like right on top of the course so i put the fight on the tv and we just kept working and, and putting in screws and stuff and, and watching the fight and it was it was fun like they had i think ufc is is actually like a really cool sport like i i, I don't know i've been meaning to get more into it but i just haven't gotten kind of around to watching the, the fights yet is what's ufc again is ufc the one way you can do any martial art or am i misremembering? that's it yeah ultimate fighting championship yeah uh okay cool that's like an actual fighting game. Like, you know, that's usually what fighting games are. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you've got, is the Kung Fu guy, is the guy who does capoeira, you know? So to see that in real life, I'm yeah, like, exactly. wow. Cool. It's badass. Yeah, it's just it's super, like, it was, it was super engaging. And, like, the fact that, like, the commentators, like, clearly had fighting backgrounds themselves. It kind of reminded me of, so I've done a little bit of battle bots, like, extracurricularly. And so it kind of reminded me a little bit of that, which, I mean, like when you go to a BattleBots event, usually the person commentating on the fight has done some BattleBots themselves and they understand the engineering and the physics and therefore they can say more interesting things and like speculate on what the player's designs are actually doing. And in UFC, it seems similar, like the, the commentators like had, had fought themselves, like even Snoop Dogg was a commentator and Snoop had, had apparently been a boxer back in the day and I looked up a bunch of Snoop Dogg's fights and they're, they're on YouTube you can find them <laughs> Crazy. So, Snoop had some hilarious comments about like uncles like fighting at a barbecue <laughs> you know like, like making fun of like you know the, 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 the fighters at the t and you know it was, it, was just, it was so much fun like I mean I, I that's one I think I'd get into and you know, if I had more discipline and free time, actually, you know, it'd be fun to like, get into the sport and fight a bit. But I don't know. It's, I don't want to get killed. That's been. <laughs> <laughs> it's been one of the strange things I've seen, kind of rolling off the back of this. Um, that games streaming and games commentary on like competitive multiplayer games. I swear, in like the last five years, uh, it's developed massively to the point where, similarly, how you might watch like a battle bots thing or like actual like fighting tournament, or perhaps like football or another kind of sport like that, um, you don't understand all of the terminology the first time you watch one of those games. You've got to actually like yeah, learn course. the language they're speaking, and that's kind of where games is at now. Like I don't watch competitive games online I, I don't it doesn't really interest me and i don't have the time what does interest me is that we've got to the point where people can have different terminology for stuff like oh this player did this they pre-fired where they expected another player to be as they turned a corner rather than waiting to see them and shoot kind of thing it's like okay so we've got this like terminology for pre-fire and then all of these other different terminologies like uh, all these different terms keep coming up out of what players are doing. It's not even something which you, you don't give out a dictionary of um, different terms when people play a game. Like it's the people, it, it, it's not the, the developers of the game who create these terms, it's the people playing them who come up with them. And there's enough 
of these competitions being streams that it does actually allow for this really high level commentary <coughs> and it, it blows my mind i find it super interesting just because it's able to exist with what was originally just people goofing around like in their lunch break or whatever shooting each other <laughs> uh, yeah it's it's a bit of an esport now i i understand i hate that i used to hate the term esport i thought it was super lame but it's yeah it's, it's it's hard to argue that it's not a sport these days especially when people are gambling and betting on it yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely no, i'm with you on that and i mean for me seeing the boston dynamics event was was like kind of my first foray into that but it was it was pretty clear like there was real money that was being spent on production for this event i mean like at least you know like a hundred grand probably you know more than that and so you know it's just like all right well it's a serious event <laughs> you know, like... i have a pretty good relationship with uh, with twitch at the moment just because i've never spent any money on any of their services uh, and they bought me dinner once because I snuck into an event a few nice. years ago, which was like a Twitch streaming like dinner. And I just showed up and they were like, are you here for the event? Yes. All right. Take a seat and order stuff off the menu. Like, great. Thank you, Twitch. That's awesome. <laughs> Elon Musk bought me dinner a few years ago. Decent. Well, I mean, it, it wasn't actually Elon. So I, I went to a SpaceX recruiting event and I kind of gate crashed. And um, I, I ended up drinking probably like three or four hundred dollars worth of whiskey at that event. <laughs> so, things I would never order with my own money, like Macallan Twenty. <laughs> the strangest event that I've been to, where there's been like free alcohol and food, was an event which was sponsored by Shutterstock. Which is really peculiar. It was a games event for games people. So Shutterstock are like uh, royalty-free pictures. So whenever you see yeah. like the groups of like the happy family TM uh, or like people <laughs> doing business, lots of people in suits shaking hands, you know, like I've never once paid for your stuff. In fact, I've deliberately downloaded like an AI plugin which removes your watermarks, and yet here you are like buying me some beer. Like sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, SpaceX was, was interesting because that, that was before I became an intern there. And I, um, I had this idea that I wasn't good enough to work for them. You know, like I, I wasn't talented enough or skilled enough. And so I, I ended up going to this recruiting event just kind of as a troll, you know, just trying to fuck around and see if I could get free stuff, which I think is why I rang up such an expensive tab. But at the end, I mean, they were like, you should work for us. <laughs> you know? I was like, all right, I guess I will. <laughs> so, was, Maybe they based it entirely off the quality of the whiskey you chose. Like, hey, this guy can be trusted. He drinks some pretty fancy whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that was it. Well, did they know? <laughs> But um, yeah, no, it's fun. Interesting place to work too. I was kind of sad I didn't get to go to a launch party because that was um, they were meant to be like very big parties. Um, one of the guys from shipping and receiving was a friend of mine, Miguel, and he was telling me about just like um, things I won't repeat that went on at those parties <laughs> that were that were pretty debaucherous. But um, no, I mean I remember. You know, it was, it was interesting. It was rewarding. I mean, you know, there were, you get to work on some of the most advanced things in the world. I mean, you know, that was, that was definitely fun. I wouldn't, I wouldn't not do it again. He's glad to have it on the See, resume. When you say yeah, launch party. <laughs> we have oh, launch I mean parties the in the games in industry. I know that's the thing, because you, you actually like launch a rocket, whereas, yeah, in games, you're talking about just letting people download your game because it's launched. <laughs> the same Probably the same level of debauchery yeah. as well, unfortunately. I would imagine, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that sounds like fun then. I'm glad that games has that. Debauchery, mm. I think, is important to living a good life, you know what I mean? 
<laughs> I hope debauchery is yeah. not bad. It depends. It depends on the level of inclusivity of the debauchery, I guess. Uh, Can if you everyone's allowed on to that? speak? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Probably not, because um, I shouldn't go on record for some of the stuff I've seen with certain things. But is well, that? I mean, being... don't say that. But I mean, when you say the level of inclusivity, like, what do you mean by that? Oh, sure. Um, actually, there's one thing with um, games which uh, I've been super happy about um, as I've become more familiar with the industry, uh, especially in the UK. Like, um, there's the games industry is very far ahead in terms of like the people that we celebrate and work with. Um, there's a lot of like different initiatives um, to include people. Like whether we're looking at kind of like race, sexuality, um, any number of yeah. different things. Like there's a real, there's a real like push for that stuff to be important, and not just like from Ooh. like a business level, but from like a real like human empathetic level. And it's it's super freeing. That's, In fact, it, it's it's super nice to be able to like work with people who perhaps in other industries or maybe like people facing roles like they might feel a bit uncomfortable um with like who they are not not from themselves but from how other people would react to them uh to work with those people yeah. and see people to be like super confident it also means that you yourself you don't need to like check your own behaviors or think like how am i coming across like who gives a shit like everyone loves each other like yeah. perform or you don't um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> It's because you know, then it just comes down to work stuff, right? That you're so empathetic to other people. It's just about the level of work you do. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that's a beautiful thing. Uh, I mean, I feel like like a true meritocracy is kind of hard to find. Um, you know, it's what you always hope for. And but I've been in some environments that claim to be meritocracies, but there's still politics going on. <laughs> so it's, it's difficult to escape that completely. I feel like. Um, but the more you, the closer you can get to that, I think, I think the happier I am too, as a professional, I mean, you know, like, cause it shouldn't matter. Like, I mean, I have coworkers that cross dress or, you know, like whatever the fuck they do, you know, and it's like, that doesn't fucking matter. Like, you know, can you do good work? All right. Let's get some stuff done. You do good work and you're nice enough. Like, great. That's all that matters, you know? Yeah. But yeah. It's, 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 there's definitely like, it's nice to like. Sometimes, like, it's depending on how it's done. It's nice to, like, highlight these things and celebrate them as well. Like, it's, I feel, especially, like, a bonsai collective, like, you do a really good job um, making sure that everyone isn't just accepted, but also we make a big deal about, like, the differences, like, between people because it makes us all, like, unique, you know? And that's very important with games, like, because we spoke about before, like, sometimes from a tech implementation like standpoint, but also from a design standpoint, it's really useful having this like mix of uh, approaches to stuff. Um, Cause you never know who's going to be playing your games. Like sure, the large sure. majority of your player base might be, you know, like white male or whatever, but <laughs> it's useful to make things, which is like playable by everyone. Um, well, it probably That's one makes thing, it more which I really like for everyone too. I mean, if there's different perspectives in there, because you don't want to see what you've always seen, like I would think, right? Like you, you want a fresh perspective. You want something different. Um, like I mean, as a white male, like I think my life is more interesting if I get other people's perspectives. So, I don't know. for sure, it's one little thing i mean i'm sure it costs quite a lot of money but one little thing about that uh, dark pictures anthology game i was playing last night was that because it's set in like 2004 during like the iraq war uh you do actually sometimes play as like american soldiers sometimes as like an iraqi soldier um they didn't just get someone with an iraqi accent to just speak in english it was actually in iraqi uh, sorry in arabic um, cool. and subtitles um and it's i haven't really seen that be done before like it's obvious it seems like an obvious thing to do right it's like all right we'll just put it in the other language and like subtitle it rather than actually going through all well, the hoops so to like game make was it? them sounds there was this bit about a call of duty game where 
the street signs in Karachi in Pakistan. What comic was it? There's there's a Pakistani comic I really like. He he played a character in Silicon Valley. The fuck is the guy's name? It's like on the tip of my tongue. But um, Kanal Nanjiani. I know who you mean. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, Kanal Nanjiani. And so Kanal Nanjiani had this bit where he was like, I was playing Call of Duty and the street signs in Karachi were in Arabic, but we speak Urdu. <laughs> like, what the fuck is that? You know? <laughs> it's the wrong language. <laughs> you know, and so... <laughs> It's interesting. There's a lot of it's stuff. Effort. It's especially when it comes to like Arabic stuff. Like the stuff is usually handled really poorly. Um, in some games, I think like Battlefields, this really big like multiplayer shooter, usually taking part like somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, the word for hotel, they got the letters completely in the wrong order. Um, okay. They just got that it was meant to be right to left, not left to right. So it's just like, all right, we'll just translate the letters and then just whoop, bleh, check that in the game. And that's funny. Yeah, you know, white and gold at all. So that, if you can uh, half ass it. I, I was at, I was I was at a restaurant last night. Um, a restaurant. I was I was getting a euro after drinking heavily last night. <laughs> so it was at a euro and souvlaki joint, and they had something where I think they misspelled the word sandwich. <laughs> it's like. It was like sandwich or like something totally different, but like it kind of approximately sounded like the word. I knew what they meant, and so it was kind of funny. I mean, it's easy to find it funny right? from from my perspective, but uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's what I what I noticed. Sorry if that's I don't mean to be missing the point. No, no, not at all. But it's you know. It, that's one of the things is like when you speak English, going to a lot of places. That's usually one of the languages they'll always try and support in some way. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on the place, and, but for the most part, you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's a there's kind of like a difference with like a small sandwich cafe in the middle of some like small European country not having the correct yeah, sure. translation compared to like, oh, hey, this game with like $20 million budget just couldn't be oh, paying someone okay. who actually knows the language, you yeah. know? Because <laughs> that wouldn't take a whole lot of money. No, 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 you're right about that, right? So all you would need is maybe like like 50 grand just to have somebody go over it, if that, you know? And probably way less to have a subcontractor just look at it and make sure it's correct. All right, mm-hmm. I could see that perspective. You're, you're right about that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm on your side now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, that makes sense. So it, yeah, it is cool that the game actually took the effort to get it right. Um, yeah. It made that particular character, uh, Salim, who I was playing as, it made him feel so much more of a, of a character. Like they they felt a lot more human to be honest. That was the the one character I wanted to get to survive to the end, because a lot of the other like American characters were all proper like hoorah, like you know we'll just shoot our way through this problem. Um, yeah. So <laughs> uh, I, I attached myself to Slim as like he's he's gonna be the one who makes it. <laughs> he's got a son and nice. he's gonna get back to his son. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that sounds like like very interestingly written. So it was like a gay dude in in Iraq during the war. Oh, so um, Salim has well, because okay. So the first time he introduced this character, Salim, uh, is when he's like just got back um, from a shift. He's in the mili- uh, the military um, in Iraq, uh, and he basically gets back home and then sees that his son isn't there. And then a few things happen and it's basically like alluded to that, like, oh, I think I've just found out that my son is gay. Um, and then immediately he's like brought out that situation because his commanding officer or whatever is like, hey, we got to go fight some Americans. Um, so there's the, it didn't it didn't really get like explored or resolved in that first scene. Oh, but then shit. throughout the game, you can kind of like, especially when you're in situations where it feels like you're going to die from a bunch of monsters or other peril, uh, 
sometimes you can choose yeah. the option I mean, to like, open up to sure other people about it. Yeah, no, for sure. And it's kind of your choice whether you're like standoffish to other characters or if you're like, interesting. You know, if someone catches so you, you looking at like a picture, you can be like open up about what you're going through. And it's like, uh, yeah, you, let's, let's make sure you get back home. Like, come on. <laughs> how, how do you feel as a player? Like, I mean, that's that's interesting because, you know, obviously you're not that character, but I feel like, you know, you must develop some kind of empathy through playing the game. Like, how does that what perspective does that put you in as as the person playing through it? It's a mixed bag, I think, because uh, it kind of depends on the characters. Like, Salim is like a super grounded character and that he's a guy who, at least from the way that I played him, he's a guy who was like a reluctant soldier. He didn't really want to be part of the war. He just wanted to get home alive at the end of the day. Uh, whereas like the some of the American characters we're playing as, we ended up just making them like full on just ridiculous caricatures where just like yeah. there was like very little like actual like human behavior going on with them. They were all just full on just like I'll just like <laughs> shoot this problem away and I'll punch this guy and then I'll guess I'll bite to this monster. Like <laughs> okay, we're not we're not we're not paying attention to you anyway. We don't care about Slim. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's all about teaming up to fight the bigger evil kind of thing. Yeah. In the context of the game, I mean, I'm assuming that's the monsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, there's a lot of like. Are there points at which the those. American troops and the Iraqi troops actually team up to fight the monsters? Ye well, yes. It depends on kind of what you do. Because. Um, there's a lot of like opportunities where you might basically like catch someone from behind and you've got the option like do you aim your gun at them or do you say like right enough firing like you're not going to believe me but there's some vampire things we've got to go shoot <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of real like tension towards that especially because like you as one player can be like oh um you know, I don't want to fight you. Like, I just want to make it back home. And the other person can then just basically rebuke, like, that little olive branch you've put out. And they can be, like, proper, like, ah. hurrah, drop your weapon. I'm I'm going to be antagonistic towards you. Uh, so it's funny to see some of that stuff play out. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's real fun. Yeah, and then you two in their head. <laughs> mm. Interesting. <laughs> Uh, it's a it's a it's a good game for that stuff. What else? What else have you worked on that you're particularly proud of? I think probably one of the most interesting things um, I worked on uh, was a series of games for for children. Like we're talking like toddlers here. Um, okay. So target market being. Uh, kids who are like two to five years of age. I say target market, but there was no monetization in these games. It was more about just like raising awareness for like this brand. Um, so the client That's cool. for those games was called, uh, oh my goodness, I've forgotten the name. It's Channel 4, but in Welsh, S4C. Um, uh. Sorry, so S4C <laughs> is like a Welsh like TV channel where you have like these animated characters. Um, they're all like farm animals. Um, and a lion, uh, and a giraffe, but they are mostly farm animals. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call that a safari. Uh, cool. But making games for toddlers who are watching a Welsh show, so you kind of end up using no language at all. So so much of what you have to communicate is just done through like images basically it's almost like very kind of like hieroglyphic you've got to show like very obvious things with like hands here's what you've got That's to cool. do like to interact with the game on your mobile and stuff um that that was probably the most interesting thing to work on because yeah you've got to like you can't just make something that's cool you've got to make something which is like very very accessible um and a way which can be like described visually, not just through a whole bunch of text. Because an adult's going to sit through cool. and like, you know, 
maybe give you a couple of minutes be interested of their time to understand it. Have their kids sit there. So one of the interesting things we did one of the games, it was literally like a block building game. So if you imagine like wooden toy blocks, very uh, like stereotypical kids toy. Um, trying to do more advanced stuff behind the scenes to accommodate for the random stuff which a kid is going to do is actually like quite a big technical challenge because you've got to like interpret like all the stuff which someone who's like three is going to do they're going to try because kids like pick up especially now if they if they're using like digital technology from a young age they'll like pick up things you can do in some apps like maybe they've messed around on google maps or just some other random game they've played like oh pinch zooming is a thing and they won't know that like pinch zooming is something which someone has deliberately added to the game or to whatever app they're using they might just expect it to work like you know you can't explain to a kid oh, oh interesting. actually that exists as an input within this game or this app but not uh, this other one takes quite a bit of uh, effort yeah, why didn't you read the patch notes, you three-year-old child? <laughs> um, <laughs> so you've got to like uh, really like actually get kids to play it, see how essentially they break it. Um, how did you then... get kids involved in the development process? Like whose kids were playing it? Like that seems like a challenging thing to do. So that company I was working with, uh, Cloth Cat, they were attached to an animation. Sorry, I worked for Third Media, and they were a sister studio to this animation company called Cloth Cat, which is quite large, uh, at least for like a Welsh company. Um, you know, with like fifty employees at that animation company, there's enough kids to go around cool. that you can test stuff. Um, so and you based just in employees, kids. <laughs> That's how you did it, basically. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's more like they get free babysitting. Well, that makes sense. Have, take because... this home, let your kids play with it, you know, like whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that, that's normal. Know, so, like, cause... I've worked for companies that do similar things, not with kids necessarily, but like, you know, we want to know, you know, what type of people we're looking for to, to work in this role. Who do you want to work with? You know, it's just like you just ask your people, you know, you're like, what you got? Like, I need some input here. For sure. And it's not just like assigned or sorry, uh, limited to games for kids as well. Like you get that a lot with games which are for a adult market. Um, sometimes it's useful to just like show something to someone who doesn't play games a whole bunch because it really like takes off like the blinkers then of like, hey, why, why can't I do this thing? It's like, oh, yeah, whoops. I've been looking at this like so closely for so long that it was obvious to me. Um, but to someone else, we need like a little bit more, like ease of use out of it. So when we tried to introduce that, I, for, forgive me for going back to this example, cause it's really all I've got in this, that's adjacent. But when we tried to let people drive our robots over the internet, um, there was one woman in particular, maybe a few other people actually that, that tried to, um, no, I remember this one lady was trying to use the joystick like a steering wheel so she was like twisting around the perimeter of the joystick area on the screen and the robot was doing behavior that didn't really make sense and we couldn't or like i'm sorry i don't mean to be rude but what are you doing you know and she goes oh i'm trying to steer it you know i'm like oh i get it now um you know, it's my bad i should have explained how the controls work better you know, and, and then you're like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of the asshole here. Like, I need to make this more accessible. <laughs> so. It's interesting, especially something like that. Like, some games do those kinds of things where you have different, like, input mechanisms to handle that. Because, like, you first see it, and, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. You're like, what, what are you doing? Obviously, you're just pointing that direction you want to go. And it's like, well, no, but on a car, yeah, you do. You turn the steering wheel. Why would it not be the same as that? Um it's interesting to kind of like yeah, have that, that pop it. up and you suddenly realize we've got a whole bunch more work we've got to do because we oversimplified this when we we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting how, you know, mass appeal can sometimes be like very, very complicated to achieve. I guess, 
you've only been doing this for like about three years now, right? You said, which is incredible, by the way, that you've done the amount of stuff that you've just stated over that amount it's of time. It's been about, so what year is it now? <laughs> I have to ask that every day. Uh, it's been but five years. Count, so then. subtract one. <laughs> So it's been I'm four sorry. years. <laughs> it's been five years since I started doing <laughs> like just exclusively like programming work for games. Um, You're but... going to be a person to watch, I think. Like <laughs> the fact that you've achieved that much over that amount of time. It's been a weird one getting into games because it's there's a lot of games courses specifically at university now, like very very focus courses but strangely when you get to the end of them most of the time people aren't like equipped to actually work on games and games are kind of yeah, it's not sense. the same as like robotics or like financial tech where if you do something poorly it's going to have real like world effects whereas in games you can kind of like smudge a lot of stuff and do a lot of smoke and mirrors yet somehow there's still this weird disconnect between, okay, I've made games for three years during my university course. Why can't I get a job? So although I've been doing like the games programming stuff, uh, uh, five years were just purely programming, six years if we're including some of the sound implementation stuff, there's still a good like two or three years of that where I was making games and, you know, I've been technically I've been like a chief technical officer and all this stuff because I've been directors of companies that I've set up. But then when you finally do all of that to get a job in games, you end up basically starting as a junior again, because only now does it count for real. Um, it's very, it's a, it's That's a weird industry thing. to get into at the moment. Um, I mean, that, that can weird, exist in robotics yeah. too, if I'm being honest. Like, you can be the CTO of a robotics company, but then start again as a junior after that. Like, that's that's not unique to games. Um, mm. That's It's more, I think, to do with the size of the company. So that, what I've noticed mm -hmm. is, like, you can, it's easier to be a startup CTO than, um, you know, to... I don't know. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of rambling. No, no, that's it's 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 kind of true. Like, because you can make stuff with your friends. Okay, maybe not with robotics here, but with games at least, um, you can make stuff with your friends. No, with but... robotics you can do that too. It's it's the same thing okay. in that sense. I suppose I'm going to make assumptions here and then say that in terms of making it like a product which you're actually going to make money off of that's usually where your experience is going to be lacking because you can make the thing, but in terms of like identifying yeah. like needs in a market or having like investors or clients, like some kind of infrastructure there. So people sure. actually no, pay you for the work you're doing. Same mm. thing. That's the bit which you, you try it out for yourself for a few years and then you're like, okay, I should just get a job at another company because I know I'll get paid every month. <laughs> Uh, which is you yeah, kind of handy when you've got to actually live and eat. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, nah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me, and, I, and that's common, right? I, I think that that exists across the board for for people that work at startups, and it does take a unique kind of person to start up right out of school instead of going to work for another company. I, I did the same thing, I might add, and uh, you know, I think it was. You know, you have this idea that like you know you can do it better. You know, like, you, you know, you're, it's a little bit of arrogance, but also you know maybe hope and optimism. And you know, you look at people like Bill Gates, you know, who did that too and did all right. Like, well, if, you know, if Bill Gates can do it. <laughs> so, That's yeah, it's kind of crazy, like doing that stuff because usually you start off by like figuring out what's the minimum amount of money I need to make for me to like just not die, which is like kind of <laughs> not what work should be like. You know, you shouldn't be like, okay, if ramen costs sixty cents for one packet, in theory, how many cents do I need to make in a month to live? <laughs> <laughs> But that's that's startup life. I mean, like even Guy Kawasaki, you know, who was the chief evangelist for Apple, like states that 
you know, that's a big part of having a startup is just living off of ramen, you know. And, and, uh, it's, it's one thing I'm glad I don't have to do now with like my current job with Bonsai because um, we've got a publishing deal with that. Um, so similar to perhaps film uh, or books, I guess, um, you don't, especially if you're a new company, you wouldn't have the capital that you wouldn't have the funding to fund your own development. Um, so ideally you want to be able to partner with a publisher who will basically be like, okay, we'll pay for it to be made. Uh, we'll pay for the marketing and we'll take this cut, uh, from the development, uh, sorry, from the, from the proceeds, from the sales, um, that I feel like that's like a real, real big part of games development. It's just all of these negotiations over contracts and stuff because they're not your client. They're a yeah. publisher. The idea is that they're selling themselves to you and then you need to check with multiple people to make sure you get the best deal, but each one is like custom fitted. It's not just the same as being like, I'm going to make this work and they're going to pay us this amount of money for that work. It's like a, how can no, we percentages, basically it's, compete it's terms. people against each other? Mm. Yeah. That stuff is fascinating to me. I'll be honest. Like, I mean, I, I, I kind of nerd out over contracts find more than I should, <laughs> but I, I enjoy it. I mean, it's, there's no way I could have run a contract engineering company, I think for the last five years without being a contract nerd. I mean, it wouldn't have been as successful as it was. That's, it. Yeah. That's <laughs> like you get it. You get something it. which I've been paying a lot of attention to recently because similarly, like whenever I would like go into employment or something, you're damn sure I'm reading through that like 30 page document. Uh, <laughs> and I've had stuff change yeah, on exactly. contracts before. <laughs> you get some like absolute nonsense stuff yeah, in there, like, like a lot of it. Exactly. Sometimes you get stuff which is like, there because clearly they like copied and pasted it from some place online or sometimes Correct. like you're well, questioning it and they'll be like my lawyer friend said that i should put this here and it's like well that's great but i don't want it there and here's why so you better change it or i'm not working here kind of thing Contracts are like <laughs> they're like a puzzle to solve <laughs> it's a fun puzzle though i mean it's it's that's a good way to look at it i feel like it's similar to engineering work i mean it's no, it's the same thing. It's just a different angle. So, oh, it's, I that's a, it's an interesting approach, actually, seeing it as like an engineering problem, because similarly to like engineering or like programming, like especially like architecture and programming, if you don't try and identify future risks early, that one insignificant thing, which you left in a contract like that's three a, years down the line, is like, Oh, if I quit now, they basically I owe the company however X amount of money because I just didn't think it would be an issue. Uh, so yeah, you got to be really like on the ball with that stuff. Have you been in a situation where that went wrong, and that's why you look at it as closely as you do, or are you just naturally cautious? And, and you don't have to I ask think... me if you don't want to, obviously. No, 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 no. It's 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 fine. Um, I think the reason why I'm cautious about this stuff is that having been a director of a registered company in the UK, you understand that it's not just like, oh, you're 25% responsible for the company if there's four directors, uh, you are all equally responsible. And wow. you get a lot of like red letters, like red text letters being like, hey, remember to submit your tax reports because if the person in on the team who you said does the tax reports doesn't do it, you're going to be the one going to court, you know? So you just kind of like Jesus. learn to just like be like, okay, where am I responsible for my own mess ups? And who's going to potentially cause me a bunch of hassle because they didn't do what their responsibility was. And then once you get into the habit of learning like how to read contracts, like you kind of understand what's just there for fluff pretty much. It's just like legal nonsense and what actually is going to matter. Um, to what you're doing, uh, whether like holidays is something which is important to you, like time off um, or compensation for overtime. Yeah. Like, you know, it's all about like passing what's given to you and then knowing what it is that you want to go for. And if in doubt, just yeah, ask for more money, usually. For sure. And I, I feel like there's a lot of times there's a disconnect too between, not a lot of times, I should say, but sometimes there's a disconnect between 
what the contract actually means and what you've negotiated in good faith with the party you're sitting across from. And that's always interesting. I mean, you brought up a good point, which is maybe they just got a boilerplate or like a template contract and you know, they, that's what they're working off of and they forgot to change it. Okay. I will always give the other party the benefit of the doubt. But then sometimes you get in this weird deadlock where it's like, why are we fighting over this? This seems pretty trivial. You know, that's, it's another reason why I've been a bit like on the ball for contracts recently is uh, to go back to like the house move uh, just done uh, in Belgium. A few, this, 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 the place I'm living in now ended up actually being the second flat, which I signed a contract on. Because the first one, after we had signed, uh, this is whole thing in uh, Belgium law where you've got to basically declare which is your main residence. Um, and that's basically like the one like you're taxed off of. Um, so Weird. the person who tried to be our land person to keep it gender neutral, um, they, the person who owned yeah, the property. Yeah, the board isn't technically neutral. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they ended up basically saying, hey, can you not register this as your main address because what? I want to say I live there? And it was just like, whoa, 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 what do you mean? Like, and they were like, well, can you just not say that you live there? And it's like, well, so you want us to rent a second property to like say that we live there? And Jesus. this says in this form here, something which you said wouldn't be a deal. We basically kind of agreed that like, okay, you will say that you live there, whatever. As long as we don't have to say you live there, that's fine. But then we started to get like notifications saying like, hey, a police officer is going to have to like inspect the property. And it's like, well, fuck, we can't move into this place then because we can't prove that you live there because you don't. And they're it's like, oh, it's fine. Just like leave yeah. back to us in this other room. And it's like, this is ridiculous. And this person had like just recently like had a new child in their family. And I, I, at a certain point, I was just like, this is nonsense. I'm not like, you know, entertaining this person anymore. So I was just straight up just like, right, how much money are you saving with taxes? And they're just like, okay, it's for like 25,000 euros or something. And it's just like, that might not seem like a big deal to you, but I kind of like, it's in like, hey, it's for a lot of money. So you, it would be really great if you could do this for me. It was like, a, I don't want to move to this new country, try and apply for a visa and then get it found out that I'm complicit in this theft of 25,000 euros. <laughs> 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 And their solution was to like, so we had the contract which said, hey, you have to say that this person lives here, which you can't do that with a contract. You can't put illegal stuff in a contract. Yeah, of course. It doesn't no, work it's total, like that. total horseshit. Yeah, yeah. You can't claim someone's what? firstborn child in a contract, you know? That's uh, like when I have somebody sign a non-disclosure agreement and they're like, well, I, I mean, secret you want to keep with me. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's a non-disclosure agreement. It pertains to business secrets only. You know, it's like... I can't, I can't, if I tell you like, you know, like something confidential about myself, that doesn't count. <laughs> it's only business stuff. So like, no, you have to, you know, like, you know, it's a different conversation. And so like, that's always absolutely interesting to try to work that out with people. Yeah. I feel like when it comes to property stuff as well, like if you're in a position of owning like multiple properties anyway, like it's not quite the same as when you're like, oh, I'm trying to rent a place and I'll be homeless. <laughs> this doesn't work out. Um, but yeah, this, 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 this person's solution to stuff was to like have the original illegal contract, which had an illegal clause in it saying that we'd lie that she lived there. Uh, they live there, whoops. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then oh, another man. contract, which would be a fake contract that we'd supply to the Belgian government to show that it was oh, just us living there. No. And then a third contract stating that the second contract was legally invalid, despite it being the only one which is legally valid. And it was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, Correct. If the government's not, doing this, that's you know? fucking bizarre. Yeah. That's not Jesus, what you want to be doing sketchy. when you're like trying to apply for a visa. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, do you mind just... Or like, if you're you know, trying to just live your life at all and not get fucked with by the government and just, you know, try to... 
you know, like I mean, one of my one of my good friends said to me, um, you know, that that did some pretty powerful stuff in industry. There's nothing wrong with paying taxes because if you're paying taxes, that means you're earning a profit. You know, <laughs> so it's like, like obviously everybody wants to pay less taxes, myself included, but at the same time. If you're paying taxes, you are earning a profit. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so yeah, maybe, that's something which is taxed. You know, yeah. More important, I think, to, to focus on profitability of your business than to focus on tax dodging. You know, I mean, if you're going to prioritize. Because you know, so, mm -hmm. taxes are a percentage, aren't they? Whereas like income is like unlimited, sure. depending on... And, and if you're spending so much time trying to circumvent taxes that you're not making money, it doesn't matter how much you circumvent taxes because you're not making money. <laughs> you know? Hey, or, I'll you know, you're paid zero percent on my one hundred dollars of income. Like, great, but <laughs> you made a hundred dollars. Or the other thing is, like, you know, if you're doing something so sketchy, like this person that you mentioned, sounds like they were. That you're putting yourself at, at risk, you know, of, of arrest, of, you know, all sorts of shit. You know, like, what are you doing? Like, how much stress are you adding to your life versus if you just paid the money and, and moved on? 30,000 kind of is a lot, a lot of money. Of, I mean, that's... Yeah. It's a lot of money. And then it's also like, is it also worth it to, like, go through all of that stress? Like, surely you want to just not have that weight to cause hanging over another you. set of renters to cause to go through that stress as well and so now you've got their stress you've got your stress you've got the real risk of getting busted i mean you've got illegal contracts two of them for one legal contract that you're stating isn't legal with another contract that you'd never be able to enforce but you're trying to scare those people into because that's all that is is a scare tactic for somebody that's not as smart as you because <laughs> in court I it's mean, more like I, not, not as pedantic I mean? as me <laughs> yeah uh, I, I would know, say smart but, I mean but yeah pedantic for sure contract stuff is I guess it, it's it's yeah it's but that's that's those are kind of experiences of the reasons why I read through contracts is because you notice those little changes and things where it's like that leaves this of. open to a risk in like a year from now and i don't want to be dealing with that in a year from now so let's change it i had one where somebody wanted my company to sign an intellectual property assignment agreement before we'd been paid so it was like everything you invent belongs to us i'm like hold on <laughs> We invent things on behalf of multiple clients. You mean to tell me that our other clients' work is yours? Like, go fuck yourself. No. That's <laughs> not that's not how it works. And they got mad when Jeez. I when I wouldn't sign this on behalf of my company. And I was like, I can't that, that would be screwing over my company. I can't do that. <laughs> you know? Like, I have a responsibility and you know, it's at this point not to sign your contract. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, you know, contracts are, uh, they're fun. They're fun. Honestly, as, as scary as the stuff can be, like you have to just have a bit of confidence with them because, you know, if you don't properly read through and understand what's going to go on, then you might not only screw up stuff for yourself, but for other people you work with or for other people That's you pay, right. for example. But being able to have that meeting or a call with someone to be like, mm, in clause two, three, a, I've noticed that there's a bit of a discrepancy between what you want and what was communicated over the phone. Here are the legal articles as to why this <laughs> needs to be changed. And it's just like, <laughs> it feels That's badass, it. honestly. It's all just nonsense. Yeah, for like, sure. No, no. With you. <laughs> but it's fun. You're right. No, no, no. It, it is enjoyable to be able to call out those clauses. And, you know, it's you're kind of showing off a little bit. You're like... I'm smart enough to understand what you're trying to pull here. You know? <laughs> I'm good enough at Googling that I was able to prove that this was incorrect. <laughs> so my, my mother's a lawyer. And so I, I've got a lot of informal training on, on this sort of thing. <coughs> and, and that's where a lot of it comes from. So you can look over my uh, future contracts I get for employment. Yeah. No, call me anytime. 
I mean, I, I don't know if I'd be very good at evaluating a Belgian contract because the U.S. precedent is different. And so, like, I, I there was a Polish contract I looked at maybe three years ago where it was a little bit perplexing to me because it was just the ways things were enforced was a lot different than what I'd seen in the States. And so sometimes you'll see something that seems straightforward but isn't enforceable. I'm, I'm sure you've noticed that, like with the Belgian law thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but I'm sure the way it was worded seemed innocent enough, right? Where it's like, you know, this is what it is. And you're like, oh, well, that seems kind of weird, but all right, I guess. You know, and then you look it up, you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's totally illegal. And so... There was there was a Polish one I looked at where the um, it was a non disclosure agreement and there was like a penalty of like so much money for every breach, which I never investigated far enough to figure out if it was enforceable or not. But it was it was very different than what we do in the states. Like in the states, it's like if you breach, we assess the damages of your breach and then you get sued for that amount of money. But in Poland, it was like, it's a flat fee every time we breach, you know, so it, is, it was an interesting way of doing it. Operational, operational business costs at that point. <laughs> How many breaches can yeah, we handle yeah, this exactly. year? All right, just cut corners on that thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I mean, you, you see very famous examples of that, that I, I probably shouldn't get into because I've been involved with some of these companies, but you know, we're like, you, you endure a fee with like the Security and Exchange Commission or some other governmental organization, but that fee for your company is not very high. And so you can afford to pay the fee. So you just break the law. <laughs> it's, Formalized um, bribing, basically. Yeah, more or less. Or, or just an ineffective penalty system. I mean, sometimes I think is, is what it comes down to is, you know, it's, you know, these, these fees aren't really set up with, with a, you know, a reference to reality or, or to what the companies are going through or every case is different. I mean, for some companies that might be bankruptcy for other companies that might be worth paying in order to be able to continue to break the law, you know, and so it just depends. America, land of the free. <laughs> Home of the brave. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I think it's like that everywhere, right? I don't think that's just America. I think that's, I just know American examples because I've conducted American business for a while. But... In the UK, a real issue we've been dealing with um, for the last like, couple of years, and especially during the pandemic, is a lot of like huge amounts of government funding being raised to like develop apps for like coronavirus stuff or to provide other services related to that or perhaps related to like the economic fallout and stuff. Uh, and then it's it's always like, oh yeah, and by the way, they didn't go through the correct process of getting people to bid for it. They just straight up just like gave it to their mate who runs their own company. And oh, whoops, oh, yeah. we gave them like 50 million pounds to like do this like tiny little job. <laughs> like, great, cool. Uh, it's, well, you, you hear know. about like the US, U.S. healthcare websites, similar, well, not 50 billion pounds, but like I've heard about like $100 million websites, you know, it's like $100 million for a website? Like, what are you, high? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. I get the feeling. Uh, I, I, I want to say it's million, but I get the sickening feeling it was actually billion with uh, the track and uh, track and trace test and trace i can never remember what it's called Jeez. uh whatever app we used uh in the uk ended up i think basically being like one of the most expensive apps developed just ever at least in the uk probably the most expensive phenomenal <laughs> money and it was super basic it literally just like just like checks with bluetooth have you walk past someone with a phone yeah did that person then get a positive test yeah send them a text you know and they charge like just yeah a stupid amount of money to make that thing, and then people can just turn it off. <laughs> you can just turn off the Bluetooth. So like, what's the point? Yeah, it makes sense. I would. I right, well, people did like depending on what industries they work in, because like you'd end up going to work, and just from proximity of like the people who you're working with, 
Oh, I guess yeah, you might be wearing like the in the ninety nine mask, right? And like maybe somebody was like you know outside the subway when you were in it, but you crossed paths, mm-hmm. and now you're fucked. You know, it's uh, my yeah, it sister's partner is like an emergency ambulance driver, which basically means that he'll drive across the country to deliver patients who need like emergency surgery. You might deliver cool. like organs between hospitals. But obviously a lot of the work he was doing with emergency patients would be people with COVID. And then if originally his job required him to use this app to make sure he wouldn't get COVID, but then he'd be getting like told to stay home from work because he's delivering somewhat a patient with an issue which the app would pick up. And then it's like, all right, so I work for two hours, get told to stay home for 10 weeks. Uh, not 10 weeks, 10 days, geez. Um, but yeah, and then very soon it was like, a, okay, it's no longer a requirement. We realize this is a dumb thing to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. Because, yeah. I mean, you need to be in proximity to a COVID-positive person to do your job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I remember I was in Texas a while ago, and um, I met my one friend's wife, um, who I'd never met, and super awesome person. Like I, I like her a lot. And uh, her name's Jenny. And the first time we met, um, they're both doctors, right? So uh, Nick is, is my other friend, uh, and, and Jenny is my new friend who I, I now very like very much. And so Jenny goes, the first time I met her, she's like, um, I would shake your hand, but I'm covered in shit and COVID. <laughs> so it turns out what had happened <laughs> is she had an, an adult autism patient uh, she, she's a pediatrician, um, but she had an adult autism, autism patient who was COVID positive where he was nonverbal. So she had to assume um, that there would be a full physical every time she saw this patient um, and therefore, you know, just examination. Um, and so this guy did not appreciate her examining his genitals. He reached into his pants, pulled out some shit and threw it at her. <laughs> and she then became covered in shit and COVID. <laughs> That's a pretty intense job, I imagine. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I would think so too. I mean, I grew up around doctors. My, my dad's a doc, my, my granddad's a doc. And, and I mean, those people work their fucking asses off. It gets, it's challenging. Mm-hmm. Jenny's a yeah, doc. You got a lot of... <laughs> you got a lot of stuff for the I've got like a, a friend in the UK Holy moly. okay sorry I thought this bottle that I dropped had a crack in it but it, it wasn't it was just the way it's been sealed on the side oh thank Christ just making sure I haven't ruined my uh, Belgian flooring <laughs> um, yeah no Belgian stuff is nice in general it's good you've got that medieval flooring still intact. Or... Might be from a lot of IKEA year. furniture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Similar thing for like That's all funny. like uh, landlords and landladies is always just like, uh, oh, we've got a really nice apartment. Uh, how are you going to furnish it? And it's like, oh, I'll just pay like three hundred dollars and just like get out the whole thing with just like the cheapest IKEA, IKEA stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Dude, this place in, in uh, Crete is really cool because the ceiling, I'm pretty sure, it looks like wood, but I think it's it used to be wood. I think it's a concrete mold, and they've just made the whole place out of concrete. And so it just appears to be um, pretty rock solid. And then I told them I'd be recording this podcast, so they left an empty room between me and the next room so I could just be really loud and you know talk <laughs> obnoxiously with you. <laughs> That's hilarious. I wonder if that's to like keep you as a patron uh, happy, or is it just to that be like it. we don't want to complain to the people next door if they move in? It's probably both, <laughs> to be honest. I would assume. It's uh, there's a place in Paris I'm staying where they're they're not so straightforward. Like they're they're very passive aggressive, and they'll wait for me to like screw up some cultural, you know, like I don't know. Like I guess I walk around too loud for Parisians, and so they were like. You know, like, when you walk, could you be more quiet? And I'm like, ah, oh, you're a dick. <laughs> Just tell me like the Greek people do, you know? Like, you know, it's way easier. Cool. 
So I feel like we're getting to a good kind of uh, stopping point. Is there anything else you want to mention? Anything you want to plug? Anything you're working on you want to you want us to link? Huh. I guess the only thing would be to like take a look at Bonsai Collective, uh, their media on like Twitter. I think they got Instagram and stuff like that, but I feel like most cool. people check out game stuff on Twitter. But the game isn't even announced yet, so also maybe don't even bother looking at it yet. At some point in the future, I will run a marketing campaign or something. I mean, people can keep. Uh, I don't think it's a violation to say look out for good stuff from Bonsai Collective. Like, good things are coming. I'm not going to say what they uh, are. Uh, real and, good stuff. Know, I've worked on it. Probably it's going to be amazing. For <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keep your eyes open, Bonsai Collective, good stuff. Steve, thanks for coming on. It's been a pleasure. You are a gentleman and a scholar. If you've stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.